Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? So, where to start today? We probably could have started with that discussion I had about the streamer before we got on <laughs> got on air. Just Let's started get, recording yeah, in the middle of that conversation. Three, yeah, no kidding. Um, <laughs> So, well, it's it's lost now. It's lost to the ages. It's, it's in the wind. That's all right. As it were. I wish there were more wind in here, speaking of. <laughs> well, um, yeah, so two weeks until the, the room starts to stay cool. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to that day. <laughs> yeah, we might skip next week just to go straight to the next <laughs> Just go out. straight into the cool. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, um, we'll power through, though. Yeah, yeah. I th- I'm already sweating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous to say that because the truth is it's probably like 76 degrees in here or something like that, which isn't bad. It's really not, but yeah, it still is. Like, It's yeah. the humidity, man. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, okay, so um, when I was in high school, I spent two weeks out in Arizona. Uh, we, had these, uh, we had these things called special projects when I was at the uh, magnet school, yeah. right? And so um, you had to spend at least one week of your two weeks of spring break. So they gave us two weeks of spring break, but you had to spend at least one of those weeks doing one of these special projects every year in order to graduate. Yeah. Um, and they had things, you know, of all, of all sizes. Uh, most of them were only one week. Some of them went at, like the full two weeks. Um, you could do uh, essentially classroom work at the school um, all the way out to like international things. Like, uh, you know, one of my buddies went to uh, Peru um, oh, wow. be- for two weeks for, I don't remember what exactly they were doing out there. Um, I, uh, had another friend that went to uh, Paris for two weeks, you know, so there were things, um, international. And, uh, so my senior year, I did one of the ones at the school. There was this, um, it was essentially a film class on good and evil. It was oh, yeah. actually, it was really cool. I, I had a good time and it was only a week. So I got a week of spring break too, which yeah. is part of the goal. Um, but my junior year, I went out to Arizona. Uh, it was, um, ostensibly like a geology trek. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but mostly it was like, um, camping and hiking and rock climbing and <laughs> whitewater seeing, rafting seeing and the scenery <laughs> and whatnot, <laughs> things like that. And it was, it was fun. Like I definitely had a good time. Um, I don't remember exactly where I was going with that. The humidity. Oh yeah. Okay. So I was going, man, it was so hot out there. So hot out there. Yeah. Um, and I was complaining about it. And, uh, one of the, the adult, um, like the faculty people out there, was from was from there. Yeah. Um, and uh, he was like, "Oh, well, you know, this is so much better than it is back in Mobile. Uh, you know, this uh, it's just a dry heat." And I was like, "Man, so is my oven, but I'll stick my head in it." <laughs> like, and th- and it wasn't even the heat that was so bad out there. Now there was a noticeable yeah. difference, like when you stepped into the shade that you don't really get here. I mean, it's still yeah. it's still dry and hot, but like you f- you feel a difference when you move into the shade. Yeah. Um, where you don't really hear. No. Yeah. Uh, like that heat transfers <laughs> through the humidity right into the shade. Oh it's yeah. Like yeah, there's no difference. Between just as hot in the shade, the yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, the the temperature swings is what really bo- bothered me out there. It was like end of March or something that we were out there, and I swear to you, one morning, <laughs> woke up at like seven thirty or something like that in the morning, and there's snow on the ground. Oh wow! And it's it's like twenty eight degrees. What? Um, yeah, and it's like you know it's it's freezing. There's snow on the ground. Uh, at like seven thirty, eight o'clock in the morning, um, yeah. by 10 o'clock, all the snow's melted. It's like 80 degrees. <laughs> oh, wow. And, uh, by the early afternoon, it was like 110 or 112 or what? something like that. It was like, how do we, this is like living on Mars, you know, <laughs> right. like 80 how something degree that? temperature swing in a day. How does that even happen? I don't know. Just because oh. the humidity doesn't trap the heat. I guess not. You know, yeah. So the sun goes down and it gets cold. It gets cold. Yeah. <laughs> It was, it was a weird place to be. I couldn't live there. It was beautiful, though. Yeah. Uh, Seems like you'd be sick. Seems like that t- type of temperature swing would, like, mess you up, like, uh, make you sick. Yeah, well, I certainly struggled with it. I bet. Um, mm-hmm. Like, my nose was running the entire time I was out there, pretty much. And right. it was so dry that, it, well, I don't want to get into a lot of details. <laughs> it was uncomfortable, uh, right? Yeah. Um, I'll just go the other way with it. So my hair was long then. It was, like, halfway down my back. Yeah. And um, there's, like, a little wave to my hair. Uh, when it was long, yeah. um, but it was there was it was so dry out there that my hair stayed so straight that I couldn't keep it in a ponytail. 
Oh, like real? just walking, it would slip it out would of the ponytail. Out. Oh, wow. <laughs> I had to wear a hat the whole time I was out there. I'm not a huge fan of hats so, yeah. or a cap, you know, and like pull it out the back. Like anyway. Yeah. yeah. That's what I had to do to keep my hair out of my face. Couldn't keep it in a ponytail. <laughs> wow. Um, so after that weird, long <laughs> anecdote. Interesting story. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, nobody uh, sent me any emails about anything I said last week, so I'm just going to assume that everything I said was 100% accurate. <laughs> well, it was. So yeah. um, This week, uh, I, I think this is getting a little bit of press, but not as much as it should. Not as much as... Um so, yeah, I, I've seen a little bit of coverage of it, but not like you would think. Of what? Of, well, the... Um, <laughs> May as well tell people what we're talking about. Well, yeah, the Trump's executive order to... Um, I guess he's put the executive order together to lower the price of prescription drugs, which you... That is what we want to talk about yeah. first. Okay. Uh, and that's the idea. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's There were actually four separate executive orders. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the truth is that they're not I okay, they aren't what we would want and they're probably not going to be as effective as um what the administration would claim. Yeah. Um but they're also going to be they're also certainly better than what press I've seen about it. Yeah. uh has claimed as well. So I there's really, like a truth somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Um and I think and this is just conspiratorial, but I just, there really has, I haven't seen that much coverage of it. And mm -hmm. I think that's just because, well, Trump's trying to do something good that people are going to like. And so they just kind of wash it under the rug. Yeah. Brush it under the rug. Yeah. One of the big things that I kept seeing, so I don't, I don't watch a lot of news, but I read a lot. Yeah. Um, and so of course, if you read a lot of news, then you can go looking for the specific kinds of news that you want. Yeah. Um, is certainly part of it, but. Uh, or the topic that you want to, to see covered. Um, and the thing that I saw over and over again is that, uh, well, you know, these aren't new ideas. Yeah. Well, like, yeah, but they've never been implemented before. <laughs> well, I, well like, that <laughs> seems like a pretty poor because there's, like, just because they're not, there's all kinds of old ideas that haven't been done mm -hmm. that are, like, amazing or could be amazing. Yeah. I mean that's that's no yeah that's no criticism at all like um, yeah and that's, well it's and, just and a way honestly, of detracting from something that he's done well, that could be positive but it's just saying well you know th these ideas have been out there for years and well that's a but I'll mm -hmm. tell you though um that's a lot of the reason people voted for Trump is because he talked about a lot of these ideas that have been talked about for a long time mm -hmm. and was serious about doing them yeah um and good or bad because I'm sure I mean there's plenty of that he's talked about doing that's not that we would not think was positive, mm -hmm. but that's a lot of the reason people voted for him was because they believed that he was he's serious about it, like he's not just pandering, he's going to do some of this stuff, yeah. Well, and the truth is that we're not going to be real excited about these when I go into some detail. I, I um, wouldn't expect us to be, but, know, but <laughs> uh, the, the argument that well, this isn't this isn't new. Yeah. is just a way of detracting from him attempting to accomplish something. I don't think yeah. he's doing it the right way, um, but uh, it's it's just a, it's an argument against Trump, not against the the ideas. Yeah, the yeah. the orders themselves. And you know, one of them is like, well, you know, there was a bill written up about this two years ago. Like, yeah, but it didn't pass the Senate. Yeah. Um, now. Once again, we could, we're not going to bother getting into the, well, ruling by fiat with these executive orders. But, yeah. um, I mean, he had a plan to, to accomplish something. It didn't make it through the legislature. So now he's just doing it. He's just going to do it on his own. Yeah. Um, and again, I, I don't approve of that, but the... To say then, well, they had this idea years ago. Well, yeah, <laughs> but they didn't, they didn't actually pass it. Like, yeah. it didn't... It didn't go anywhere. And there's still plenty of people complaining about drug prices. Oh, Even yeah. though, actually, um, from what I read, it looks like drug prices have gone down quite a bit since he took office anyway. Have they? Um, yeah, I mean, like a, a significant amount, like a, yeah. enough that should be noticed. Really? Um, now, I have... I have a pretty good insurance plan, so I have like a max that I pay for almost everything. So I don't, you know, yeah. uh, if if they lower a drug price from three hundred dollars to two hundred and forty dollars, I'm only paying twenty dollars anyway. So it, I, like I don't notice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I mean, I can't say, and I try not to look at the list price on the little 
tag yeah, that yeah. they give you because it's just nobody needs that kind of stress in <laughs> yeah. their life. <laughs> um, but let's let's go over the the executive orders. Absolutely. There there were four. Um, I think he actually signed three. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to start with the one that I don't know whether he actually signed it or not. It's not, it's not listed at WhiteHouse.gov as a, as an executive order that's that he's signed, um, but the information about it is out there. Yeah. Uh, so um, we'll talk about it, and there's like some caveats. Just keep in mind, yeah. yeah, that this may or may not have went into effect. And this is one of the things that even though the news is trying to ignore it, they say that this is one of the most significant uh, of the executive orders. And essentially what it does is it requires the drug companies to charge Medicare Part B. Um, and Medicare Part B is just uh, doctor administered, essentially. Okay. Um, so it's not when you go buy uh, prescriptions at the drugstore, that's Part D. Okay. Um, it's when you're... Uh, you're administered medication by a doctor generally in the hospital. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Um, that's when it falls under part B or when you're on an ambulance, anything that they push while you're on an ambulance would be under part B, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and I suppose, uh, like, uh, outpatient procedures and stuff that are done from doctor's offices, if they give you anything, like administer anything there, that would, would also be that, part yeah. B. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so anyway, uh, the, it's requiring the drug companies to charge Medicare Part B um, for these drugs the same price as they charge in other countries. There's like 15 other countries that they listed that they're going to take a an average, essentially, of the price that is paid in those countries, and that's what the, the drug company will be allowed to charge Medicare Part B. Um, now, there's a couple of reasons that that can matter, and when I cover the next one, um, I'll... Get into a, some yeah, of that. Yeah, because that's an interesting way to do it. <laughs> I'm curious to what the... Well, uh, p- the reasoning is that um, that people in the U.S. have list prices for medications that's r- like anywhere between um, 20 and 100% higher than it than the, uh, the charges in other countries for the, okay. like the exact same medication. For the same medication, um, yeah. Now, the reason this is is because... Um, well, in some ways because of the wealth of this country, but in, in some ways because of the legislation, the prior legislation has protected them. Um, and other countries uh, do some price fixing. Um, yeah. You know, these more socialized countries in Europe, for example, do a lot of price fixing, um, saying this is what this medication should cost regardless of the developmental costs and the manufacturing costs and whatever. Yeah, this now, is- um, and to be fair on that, like a whole lot of the cost of uh, medication in, in a lot of cases is marketing. Well, um, they spend a, a tremendous amount of money on marketing too. Yeah. Um, and I was talking with a guy at work actually the other day, like that's fairly new. Um, yeah. Remember, it was only like 20 years ago, roughly, that they, they couldn't advertise prescription medications like on uh, TV. Yeah. Um, and that changed. And now and it's like, that's now, all that. Now, well, it is during the news. I'll tell you that. It's the weirdest thing. Yeah. Um, I don't watch the news on TV, so I don't get yeah. to see it. In fact, I don't even have TV anymore, <laughs> so I, I don't get to see any of that. But um, anyway, uh, the that particular uh, executive order is essentially on the back burner till at least the 24th of August. Okay. Um, and he said that he was going to give the... Um, the pharmaceutical industry till the 24th of August, essentially, I guess to make a better offer. Okay. Um, or they would start implementing it. Yeah. Um, so it, he, he's giving them time to negotiate, I guess with him. <laughs> <laughs> Come to me. <laughs> um, that's for, totally what well, something he would do. Too. Yeah, absolutely. That's a total Trump move right there. <laughs> for a better deal or I'm going to make it this way. Um, that's awesome. Now, what they're doing in there, I don't know. There's a couple of ways of looking at this. Um, now, R&D costs are high uh, for uh, pharmaceuticals, um, but not on a specific medication. Yeah. Now, the, the problem, the, the thing that people aren't seeing uh, in a lot of cases is that there is a whole bunch of R&D that goes into drugs that just don't work. Okay. Right. Like, so they spend time developing things to try and, and find an answer to a problem. And there's a lot of things that just don't work out. Yeah. Um, they have too many side effects. Uh, they don't actually do what they're supposed <laughs> to do. This medication has too much anal leaking. We can't release it <laughs> yeah, to the public. <laughs> exactly. Um, so the, they have to cover their R&D costs on the things that fail. 
yeah. uh, with their profits as well. Oh, absolutely. Not just their R&D costs on the actual drug on that makes it to market. the one that makes it to market, yeah, right. gotcha. Um, and because of price-fixing issues with other countries that are done at the legislative level, uh, they're trying to make up costs in places that don't have those kind of restrictions, like the U.S. Yeah, well, and that's some bull, because we're basically subsidizing these other countries exactly. when it comes to that. Yeah, you're... you're Subsidizing socialized medicine in Europe. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I'm not okay with that. No. Uh, of course, I'm not in favor of subsidizing our own either, well, which yeah. is probably in the end what would end up happening. But now you have to accept that the profit motive is a thing that makes people go out and try and find new drugs. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, so if you take that away, if you say, well, we, we're only going to allow you this tiny little profit, then that takes away the incentive to find new things. Um, and I, I had the reverse discussion with, uh, um, uh, some people about patents also. So uh, yeah. I was like, we can deal with that some other time. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to get too far. Off track. We've, we've covered patents before anyway. So yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a couple of ways of looking at that and I, yeah. I think arguments like good faith arguments could be made in both directions. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm right. But, you know, uh, you usually are pretty sure of that <laughs> if, if, if anyone disagrees, you can email me, Michael at the Liberty Mike. Uh, um, so then well, let's just move on to the second one, because yeah. uh, then we can come back to that li list price issue. OK. Um, and I do want to point out also, though, that the, the first one, um, it only affects the charges for Medicare Part B. Oh, that's right. OK. All right. So your private yeah. insurance, your Blue Cross or whatever. Yeah. Doesn't change anything there. <laughs> yeah. In fact, it might drive the price up there. Oh, yeah, because they're once again, they're going to have to subsidize Because they can't that. collect it from the government. Exactly. Now, the bright side is that it could save a lot on Medicare costs, which, you know, your taxes pay for that. Yeah. So yeah, maybe you make up for it in other ways. <laughs> Hard to say. I've never seen them lower taxes significantly and keep it that way, so I don't think that that's good. Yeah, I, would, I wouldn't hold my breath on that one. <laughs> no, no. Um, so the second one, and this, this was signed. Um, it reclassifies, uh, we're going to use scare quotes for rebates, um, negotiated by health plan sponsors and uh, pharmacy ben benefit managers, um, hereafter referred to as middlemen. That's how it refers to it in an executive order, and that's how he referred to it when he was talking about these things. Okay. Um, the middlemen uh, between the manufacturer and the distributor, essentially. Um, of these prescription drugs. Uh, it's reclassifying these rebates, at least some portion of them, as kickbacks. Um, now, it really only affects, uh, again, Medicare patients. Uh, yeah. Now, what it does, though, is it changes, it, it lowers the list price uh, by taking these rebates out of the middle and having them apply directly to the 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 point of sale, essentially. Yeah. Um, it reduces the list price. It matters for Medicare because uh, lowering list, the, the list prices are used to calculate uh, the payment that Medicare makes on the medication. Yeah. Um, and the, I, I think it works essentially the same way in um, pharmaceuticals. This is how it worked with uh, medical services when I worked in the medical industry, and I, I think it's essentially unchanged. Um, the, the Medicare would calculate the average cost of a particular procedure or service, um, and then they would, that's what they allowed the provider to charge. Yeah. Okay. We have decided after looking at a bunch of data that this should cost $300. Yeah. So, what you can charge is $300, and if your charge for that service is greater than that, you just have to write off the rest. <laughs> All right. And then Medicare will pay 80%, and yeah. the patient or a coinsurance is responsible for the remaining 20%. Yeah. All right. So um, I, I assume that it works essentially the same way with these pharmaceuticals. So what they're talking about by lowering list prices, it lo lowers what the allowed amount, like the average cost, um, yeah. and then would, uh, you know, as a result, also lower the uh, coinsurance or the um, the remaining twenty percent, right, to yeah. save patients money. So now, again, you know, essentially, this is just like playing around with uh, how you what you call things. Yeah, I mean, it's just really playing around with semantics. Um, the 
I think that probably what should be focused on the more interesting bit is that I, now I was trying to understand this and I don't know that I, I have it completely. Yeah. Um, so if anybody out there understands this better or is in this industry, please like email me Reach because out, I would yeah. like to know how this really works. But the way I understood it, um, is that this is, this is the middlemen, the pharmacy benefit managers, the plan sponsors, et cetera. They're essentially running a racket, um, where they, negotiate these rebates or discounts between the manufacturer and the point of sale and they they pocket the difference or a significant percentage of it <laughs> um wow and so like you know i bought an epi pen last week i paid 20 dollars for the epi pen but the list price was like 360 dollars yeah. now the way i'm i'm understanding this is that this pharmacy benefit manager or somebody in the middle um, negotiated a reduction of the cost of that, um, you know, rebated it somewhat, but they're still showing you the full price at the, the point of sale. Yeah. Right. And then they're taking their money out of that rebate in the middle and it either, um, you know, some of it goes to different parties, but that these pharmacy benefit managers are, are, um, part of that. Yeah. And they're pocketing a, a good deal of it. Huh. Um, Seems like a shady game. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and I have a note here that says prices on prescription materials, and I don't know what I was talking about there, so I have no idea what I was trying to note for myself. And I put a star next to it, so I guess it's important. It must but, be important, then. <laughs> but now I don't know what I was, what I was trying to remind myself to talk about. Not important enough to remember. Yeah, I guess not. Um, Wow, that's disappointing. I wonder why. Maybe it'll come to me in a minute. <laughs> About halfway through, it's going to be like, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that list price thing is, uh, you know, it's the same thing that would be affected by these, uh, the international uh, reduction, like basing on the average from other countries. That's why I said I would come back to that portion gotcha. of it, like how it would affect things. Yeah. If they reduce the list price at the point of sale, it's going to reduce the um, allowed amount that, or the, the charged amount that Medicare will permit. Um, and then as a result, also reduce, uh, the coinsurance payment and so forth. Uh -huh. Um, now there's a whole bunch of, uh, of pushback from the pharmacy benefit manager industry <laughs> but there sector. Is. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, they're saying, well, this is a, you know, this is a terrible plan because it, it could raise costs for seniors. Okay. Now, I just want you to think about that for a moment. Yeah. And and just like dig down and see if you believe that these pharmacy benefit managers are upset about this change um, that could limit the amount of money they can pocket in the middle Yeah. Uh, by calling it kickbacks, which are illegal instead of uh, rebates. Um, <laughs> and uh, see if you think that they're concerned and the reason that they've prepped this big ad campaign to push back against this uh, this plan um, is because they're really concerned about the costs to seniors or whether you think it might actually be um, the cost to their bank account balance. Yeah, or their jobs because... Well, I mean, that's true too. I mean, now, yeah. Um, you start dipping into that bank account enough, yeah. jobs start disappearing. And Trump was talking about like doing this as trying to eliminate these middlemen. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure um, he is. Like, I'm sure there's no question in my mind that that's what he wants to do. Yeah, so <laughs> just... You know, when you see that they're pushing back against this and they're claiming that it's for, uh, you know, humanitarian concerns. Yeah. Consider that it might not be. It's probably not the case. Yeah. yeah. Um, then uh, the third one. Man, I wish I knew what my little note was about. Well, we're moving on. <laughs> um, the third one was uh, reduction of trade barriers, um, allowing uh, import or purchase of prescriptions from other countries. That's something that's been out there for a long yeah, time. Yeah, I'm on board with this. Oh, I'm absolutely on board with that. I mean, that's I something. I think it doesn't go far enough. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, because it still has to meet the FDA requirements. Okay. Um, the, it's reducing these trade barriers in a very limited way. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, uh, it specifically mentions Canada, but they talk about, you know, other countries that meet the same, you know, quality standards, et cetera. What about Mexico? Well, he did not mention Mexico. I bet it didn't. <laughs> um, and uh, and then you know, and Canada, like 
the Canadian <laughs> government came out against this because they're concerned that they're going to lose their supply of much needed medications to U.S. buyers oh, really? um, as a result of this, et cetera. So they're probably going to keep up barriers even if the U.S. wants to drop them. Yeah. Um, so this may not actually do much of anything then. Right. Which is a shame because that's really where, I mean, I think that's a solid free market answer is, is opening some of this up. Yeah. I mean, I think that if it was actually like dropping trade barriers, period, yeah. if they were saying, Hey, um, if you, a uh, drug purchaser want to buy a drug and somebody somewhere else wants to sell it to you and you both agree on a price, yeah. <laughs> then that's the end of it. You get to do that. <laughs> yeah. Then I would absolutely be on board. But like I said, um, yeah. they're still like, they're trying to get the FDA to like go into overseas manufacturing and so forth to ensure that that meets their standards. And, yeah. um, as you always like to point out, just remember that every drug that has ever been recalled because it was dangerous past the FDA first. <laughs> exactly. I was fixing to say it. You beat me too. Oh, sorry. I didn't know if you would <laughs> think okay. about it right now. So I, was, no. I wanted to make sure that got out there. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, yeah. and then, uh, the last one is, uh, federally qualified health centers, um, will, s- will sell insulin and epinephrine uh, at the price they paid um, to qualified, low-income, uninsured, et cetera, persons. Yeah. Um, now, again, this is very limited. It, like, it's not a terrible idea, although, again, this is like a legislating prices, um, yeah. which I don't like. Yeah. Um, but it, it's... It ends up being worse than that. So the the federally qualified health centers um, are government subsidized, like dock in the box type yeah. locations, right? Um, they're uh, in a sense. I mean, it's like I suppose it's like Planned Parenthood, except Planned Parenthood is a very spe- does a, a very specific kind of health care, whereas these um, FQHCs are like a general practitioner. Okay. Um, yeah. But the same kind of thing. It's like this federally subsidized. A uh, dock in the box facility that provides a wide range of healthcare services to the um, the underserved or uh, poverty stricken yeah. yeah communities, um, and so these like a lot of these places qualify for um, the uh, 340B program, um, which um, has manufacturers sell them drugs at a penny per unit of measure. Yeah. Right. So it's, they call it penny pricing. Yeah. Um, and what they're saying is that specifically, uh, insulin and epinephrine, um, if, uh, an FQHC qualifies for the penny pricing, that's the same cost that they'll sell it to people that they're selling it to. Oh, okay. All right. So, um, it does, uh, in, you know, low income areas, um, allow people who need like diabetics to get insulin at a reason, like better than reasonable Way cost better, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, almost like free cost. Yeah. yeah. And epinephrine isn't really widely used, but it's the, it's the prevent you from dying from bee stings and stuff like that. Okay. Like I, the yeah. EpiPens. That's like what's that, in what the I just got. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, so, like, there will be some benefit for a limited number of people yeah. uh, as a result of this. Um, once again, though, uh, I think that you're going to see them try and make up the costs elsewhere. Yeah, um, that's the, the seen and the unseen. Yeah. Um, and the, the 340B program specifically, like, this, to just explain, like, how limited this executive order is. Yeah. Um, it only uh, applies to these federally qualified health care centers. Um, it does not, um, it does not apply to everybody who, uh, qualifies for the 340B penny pricing program. Oh, really? Yeah. Just these FQHCs. I gotcha. Right? Um, and there's, the, the program itself is taken advantage of primarily by hospitals, not like these little community clinics. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the hospitals can, um, can meet the requirements for the 340B program, and they're like the worst offenders for pocketing the discount. And but yeah. they're not mentioned in this order at all, so it doesn't yeah. it doesn't change anything for them. Oh wow! <laughs> so there are like some real legitimate problems with this, but I do see yeah. it, at least you know I don't know I I hate giving this guy credit over and over again, but 
in there's, a lot of there's ways, there's a serious effort being made here. Yeah, I, I on, think so on too. His part, yeah. Now, everybody's got their own ul- ulterior motives for this. Um, obviously, like the news is not covering it because they want Trump out. Um, right. Trump's doing this thing because he wants to stay in and he wants to show that he's making some progress. Yeah. Uh, the truth is that none of this is actually going to have that great an impact. Um, all these executive orders, they still need like specific rules and legislation written. Yeah. Um, so like, n- there's going to be no impact whatsoever for probably several months while um, the executive offices are trying to put together the actual rules. Yeah. Um, and then there's some uh, some caveats within the um, some of these executive orders that may prevent them from ever coming into effect anyway. Oh, yeah. So at the end of the day, it's all just <clears throat> kind of smoke and mirrors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a lot of it is. Yeah. Um, but... If the media would talk about it, I think that it would at least start it getting cons- a conversation going about what really could be the answer to some of these problems. Yeah, um, start a national debate. Now, I think a, a like a real, like a drop of trade barriers, I think would have a huge impact. If you yeah. let people make their own decisions, you know, I mean, nobody wants to buy a drug that's going to kill them. Well, that's just it. <laughs> yeah. Even yeah. heroin users don't want to buy a drug that's going to kill them. Yeah. I mean, they may realize in the back of their head that it will eventually kill them, but that's not yeah. their goal. That, not today, though. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. The one I take today doesn't need to be that one. <laughs> I mean, and you have the internet available to you now. Like, there's plenty of places to, to vet manufacturers and, and the source of these medications if you're buying online or something. Yeah. And it, cer- it still doesn't stop people that just cross the border and buy the stuff anyway. Yeah. Um, and then in in some cases, these things that are prevented that you can't import to the U.S. are produced in the U.S., exported somewhere else, and then you can't bring them back in. <laughs> and there's also plenty that you can't bring in right now. You can't buy in the U.S. even though the exact same medication is sold and purchased here in the U.S., but it costs twice as much. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you can't, you know, just get it mailed to you from Mexico or wherever. Yeah. Or Canada. <laughs> or Canada for that matter. Right. Yeah. Um, so there, there's lots of problems with this and, and the free market would help a lot of this. Oh, um, yeah. I don't, I don't know that these particular things that they're doing because essentially it, it only applies to Medicare stuff or government programs. Um, it's probably just going to be shifting money. Uh, around. So, okay, we'll charge Medicare less, um, but we'll just raise the price uh, for everybody else and, you know, make up the difference that way. Like that's probably going to be the end result. Um, If they actually push out these, uh, these middlemen, um, there could be an impact in higher prices because you don't have people that are explicitly um, discounting. Well, negotiating. Negotiating it. Yeah. But somebody will fill in that job. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, it may not be this broad negotiation because, like, another thing that the middlemen do is that they start promoting particular medications. Yeah. Right? So, um, you know, the drug company comes out with a new version of the same thing, but it costs uh, more. Um, The pharmacy benefit managers, you know, part of the deal is that, okay, well, you know, we'll, um, we'll rebate or discount by this amount, but you when you get called about this medication, push this medication instead. Yeah. Um, and you know, and then we all make that more money, you know, that yeah. kind of thing, um, goes on too. It seems to me, like I said, I didn't yeah. entirely understand all that as I was reading into this, I was like, this can't be real. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, but it seems to be, but it is. Yeah. <laughs> and they've been protected by the government up until now. Yeah. Um, so I think reducing those protections could be beneficial. Yeah. Um, I think reducing trade barriers, eliminating trade barriers would yeah. be better, but reducing trade barriers would be beneficial. Any step in that direction is going to help. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think a big thing that could be done um, is just to allow you to buy insurance across state borders. Yeah. Well, that was during the insurance debate. That was the <laughs> big thing that, that nobody wanted to talk about that would be huge is to be able to, you know, if, if I if I want to go buy my insurance out of Tennessee, I can do that, <laughs> you know. Whoever's got the best price. Mm-hmm. Well, and right now, it um, really only limits the insurance companies to the big insurance companies because the uh, requirement um, is that you have to have like a brick and mortar office in any state that you're conducting business. Yeah. So like your big insurance carriers can afford to have like to pay rent. Offices in all of these places. Yeah. But um, the actual like the... um, the actual need, the real need to have a brick and mortar 
uh, location in any state in order to do business is completely eliminated with the internet. Yeah. Yeah, I there's mean, no reason for that at all anymore. No, right? you're not except going... that it protects these big companies. Yeah, because they can afford to put offices in every state, whereas smaller insurance, like smaller, more regional um, insurance carriers that have prices that they could, uh, you know, um, negotiate with residents of California, but they can't afford to build an office there. Now they can't do it. Yeah, they're they're cut off from that market completely. Yep. Um, so I think that, that would be a big part of it. And again, that's another one of these. So here's the thing: like a lot to sum up. Yeah, to summarize. <laughs> um, a lot of this is uh, trying to put new legislation in place to fix existing le- legislation. Yeah. And that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's never the answer. Like, you don't fix a problem of government by adding more government. The best thing to do if you want if you want these things to sort themselves out, you need to get a government out of the way. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Let the market sort it out. There will be some problems. There's always problems with the market because there's problems with every system. Yeah. But it I'll will sort the, itself out better. I will take the market problems over the other problems any day. Yeah, because the government just lends itself to extreme corruption. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If nothing yeah. else. Yeah. To, for starters, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, of course, you know, again, like if <laughs> you don't fix a problem by applying more of the same cause. Exactly. It's just, it's just silly. <laughs> Inane. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. There's actually, so I wanted to jump to our other topic, but I did, it occurred to me um, earlier, I wanted to mention this uh, as an addendum to the last podcast. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, one of my friends was saying that he really liked the bit about the Japanese um, privilege. In Japan, right? <laughs> yeah, right? And so I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't also mention um, that if you want to talk about Japanese privilege, depending on how you define power, um, and a lot of people look at wealth, yeah. uh, there's Japanese privilege here, too, in the U.S. <laughs> All right. Like, um, the, uh, they are uh, disproportionately successful. Yes, yes, they are. Um, East Asians are disproportionately successful in the U.S. Yeah. Um, so you talk about the you know white supremacy, uh, a white supremacist company in, or country in a white privileged country, but actually, um, based on uh, median household income, the most <laughs> successful group of people in this country is East Asians. Yeah. And in fact, their um, their incomes are roughly twenty five percent higher than the average. And yeah. uh, between twenty and twenty five percent higher than um, than whites, <laughs> and uh, if we just start picking this apart into the the different subgroups, right? So the, the Japanese were imprisoned in this country for being Japanese less than a hundred years ago. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, the Vietnamese, most of them came over here after the Vietnam War, um, yeah. you know, escaping the country and came here with next to nothing. Yeah. Um, the, uh, you know, the Koreans is more or less the same story, yeah. right? Uh, the Chinese, a lot of the Chinese, uh, were brought over here as slaves on the railroads, <laughs> right? <laughs> but so it, it's, these cultures all though have, have a, they're culturally, they have a hard work ethic. Like sure. they, and they do like, I mean, I've, I've known and worked with enough to know, like, mm-hmm. I mean, they, they're, they're always on time. They're always like. Always busy. Racist. Like, <laughs> what can I say? I mean, I, I see what I see, you yeah. know. Um, Even positive stereotypes are racist. You know? <laughs> Apparently they are yeah. because, I mean, <clears throat> it's, but it is crazy. And I mean, you you see it though. Like it's, yeah. there's, you see why, how this happens. Well, and there's so other factors to, too though. Um, like a, a lot of the East Asian populations are uh, on the average older than, for example, the, um, the black populations, the Hispanic populations that, that don't match up as well on the median household income. Yeah. Now, um, experience, uh, has a, a significant experience can have a significant impact on your income. <laughs> Imagine that. Right. Um, so there, there's other things that are involved in this too. And, you know, I just go back to the point that we make over and over again. I, yeah. I am not saying that there aren't some, uh, systemic issues that disproportionately negatively affect um, uh, black Americans and Hispanics in this country. Yeah. There are. There oh. definitely are. Yeah. Um, that being said, like, at some point you have to take responsibility for some 
portion of where you have ended up in life. Yeah. Oh, right? I, yeah. Like, and you, you, it's, I leave it up to you to figure out what percentage that should be. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously somewhere between zero and a hundred percent, but, um, it's not zero. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like we all yeah. make choices that put us in bad places. Yeah. Wow. And, and like I had said on the last podcast, I'm a big believer in, you know, control what you can control. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I talk about this a lot when I'm at work, um, because what I find so often, it's so easy. There's so many excuses out there to not be successful in what we do. Um, if you just focus on those, you're, you stand no chance of being successful. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm training managers and when I'm trying to build people, I'm always like, what can you affect? Like I, you can't affect that. You you can't control when the truck's going to show up. Like yeah. you, you don't have any control over that, but you have control over what you do at that time in between. Mm -hmm. So like, let's, let's talk about that. Yeah. Like, let's not talk about the fact that we can't control that. You know yeah. what I mean? There's, there's random things that will affect outcomes, yeah. but you can't control the random things. Exactly. And so maybe something random causes you to fail in some way. Yeah. Um, but instead of focusing on that random event, why don't you focus on what you did, the choices you made before that, that may have mitigated the effect of that random event. Yeah. Like how could you have done things differently that maybe when that random event happened, it wouldn't have affected you so bad. You were better prepared for it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's no kind of transition at all, but I just, I just wanted to throw that out <laughs> just there. It just felt like it needed to be in you there. Know, it's one of those, um, those uncomfortable facts, right? Like yeah. the, the facts that get in the way of the narrative. And, uh, and it's actually like broadly ignored, uh, <laughs> right. you know, like they, they don't tend to talk about, um, you know, wh where the Asians fall, uh, when they start talking about racism in this country because it doesn't fit. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Um, so the, the last thing that we want to talk about, and we got, you know, 15 minutes roughly, um, to talk about it, which isn't nearly enough time. Uh, Never is. But um, I just wanted to talk about the Fed some. We haven't actually spent a lot of time on this podcast talking about the Federal Reserve. Um, it's come nowhere, up from time to time. Nowhere near as much as we need to. Yeah, that's <laughs> Probably that's need to do true. a whole podcast one day. Yeah. And I, the Fed. I, I promise this is less boring than it sounds like it would be. <laughs> um, I think the Fed's fascinating. <laughs> so, yeah, I do too. Uh, so, uh, the thing that we've talked about the most on this podcast is their creation of money. Yeah. Right. Um, we've spent a lot of time talking about how they create money out of thin air. Um, and then they, uh, they spend it in various ways. And this is how, um, so this has so many effects, right. That are, that are bad for the things that we complain about in the economy. Right. Um, it, uh, it heightens the difference between the rich and the poor because the first people that get to use that money get to use it at its full value. But if you create a whole bunch of money out of nowhere and you don't have the production or, um, or uh, product capacity to support that, then all it does is it reduces the value of all the money out there in the economy, all the currency. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's when we talked about this the most is when we were talking about the difference between money and currency. Yeah. Um, so if you create a whole bunch of currency, it reduces the value of, of the currency uh, because it, it's it's got to be pinned to something. And it's generally like the total production value of of your country. Yeah. Um, or uh, it, it's total value in products or co a combination of the two, really. Right? Yeah. Um, so uh, if you create a whole bunch of money, and you distribute it out there, like the, the people that get it first um, are the banks, yeah, right? The, the already wealthy. Um, they get to use that money and invest um, in the things that make them more money. Uh, then those people get it next. They get to invest, you know, and it, and it kind of trickles down. But yeah. by the time it gets down to the average Joe, um, it, the uh, inflationary effect has taken, taken hold. Yeah. And so when the government creates it, uh, it's, you know, worth a hundred percent of what it says, even though it shouldn't be anymore. Yeah. Um, because it doesn't matter until it gets into circulation. Yeah. Well, so then the, the banks get it and it's probably still close to a hundred percent because they're who actually distributed out there into the economy in the first place. Yeah. Um, through various means. And so then it goes into these various investments. Well, maybe it's worth 80 percent of, uh, of its initial value at that point. But by the time it gets down to you and me, it's only worth like 60 percent. Um, yeah of its initial value. And th on top of that, everything that we have saved up is, worth is now less. worth less too. Yeah. Right. Um, and so it, it further enriches the rich, um, and it drives inflation 
And uh, another side effect, because this is one of the things that they do to get the money out there in the economy, is that they buy stock, yeah. right? They create money out of nothing, and then they buy stock with that money. <laughs> yeah. All right, and as, it pushes as a up, way to inject it into the economy. Exactly, yeah. and so and it pushes up stock prices, or maybe props up stock prices would be a, a better way of saying it. Yeah. Um, and this is a really common reaction to a depressed economy. So they did a ton of this in two thousand eight. They yeah. started creating a bunch of money and injecting it into the economy by buying stocks to try and keep the stock market value up. Yeah. Um, so we were talking about some of the other side effects of this, and. Uh, another one of those reactions to a depressed economy is that they start lowering interest rates. Yeah. Um, they're trying to encourage investment. Um, yeah. Cause the idea is, is the lower, the, the easier it is, the cheaper it is to borrow the money, mm -hmm. the more likely you are to go start that business. Yeah. To borrow build and spend. that building, whatever mm -hmm. the case may be. Exactly. Um, um, and of course, you know, this is part of what caused the, crash in 2008 too. We'll probably spend like a good bit of time on the, the root causes of that crash at some point. But, um, by reducing the cost of borrowing money is what encouraged the overinvestment or malinvestment that then when the, um, the, uh, uh, interest rates adjusted, people could no longer afford the loans that they'd gotten. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, created this kind of domino effect where everything came crashing everything down. Everything just com comes to an end. The whole thing right. crashes. So, but we're, so this, what prompted this is that, um, I, uh, I was moving some money around this week. And so I had some money that I didn't, that was just kind of sitting and I wanted to do something worthwhile with it. So I was starting to look at just like simple, um, uh, safe investments that where I could put this money. Yeah. And so somewhere uh, to park it. Yeah. Um, yeah. cause it's just sitting anyway, right? Yeah. Like I'm not doing anything with it. I don't have anything that I need to do with it right now. So I, it, rather than it just like losing money to inflation, um, I thought that I would try and find some way to like make up the difference. Yeah. All right. So if I'm losing 2% a year, which <laughs> is the, their target inflation rate, yeah. um, then, you know, I need to do something or my, uh, we'll say ten thousand dollars is only um, worth uh, nine thousand eight hundred uh, at the end of the year, <laughs> yeah. and so I want to kind of try and make up that two, you know, yeah. two hundred dollars some way or another. Yeah, is my math right on that? Doesn't seem right. Anyway, doesn't matter. <laughs> You're the math man. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I, I started looking at the the simple safe investments. So uh, historically, yeah. uh. Working people in this country, if they had money that they didn't need at the moment, um, could do really easy things like put money in a money market account at their bank or, or invest in a CD, like, a, you know, start yeah. rolling CDs. CD is the one I'm most familiar with myself. Yeah. I, um, I had an aunt that uh, that was reasonably well off. I mean, so she wasn't wealthy, but she yeah. had more than she needed yeah. um, by the time she died. And essentially, she spent her whole life... Uh, taking um, you know money that she didn't need and just rolling CDs. So you yeah. put a, a, you know whatever money you don't need at that time into a CD for twelve months. When it when it finishes and it pays off its interest, you take that full amount, you put it into another CD, roll it, you know, roll and just it, keep going, going, and that's, going. That's how you want to do it, right? Um, so I was checking the prices at my bank or, or the interest rates mm. at my bank for money markets and CDs, and I was floored. Yeah. All right, because we've. The Fed has maintained a near zero interest rate for more than a decade now. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. In this country, and uh, and that rate is really what banks charge each other um, yeah. for uh, loaning money. They have to maintain a certain level of their total um, value of overnight when they close, and if they're short, then they borrow money from other banks. And um, you know, essentially what it comes down to is the less it costs them to borrow that money, the more likely they are to go past their number. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, to loan out more than they should. Yeah. <laughs> is another way of looking at it. <laughs> right. That. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so, but that affects the interest rates that trickle down to us because yeah. if it costs less for them to borrow money, um, then they, you know, a bank that was trying to, uh, to charge 5% interest for you to borrow money, it wouldn't work because you can go to the bank next door and get it for less. Yeah. And eventually those interest rates that they're trying to charge customers for money come down close to what they're charging each other for money. Yeah. Um, just which
Well, they might actually, but pretty sure um, they mandate it. I could be wrong. I, I don't think that they do. I think it's just a matter of competition. It may be. I mean, um, I'm not going to say. Now, the Fed mandates what they uh, what they charge when they loan to each other, yeah. and the Fed mandates what they what the Fed charges when banks have to come to them as a bank of last resort to borrow money too. Yeah. Um, which is uh, either like a quarter percent less or a quarter percent more than what the banks charge each other. I think it's actually a quarter percent more. Yeah. But uh, anyway, um, the just even if they didn't, uh, they might mandate the the interest rates to normal people. Um, yeah. to regular customers but even I'm if they sure. didn't uh yeah. competition would drive it down would make it yeah yeah would bring it to that same result mm -hmm. because even if if a bank can borrow money at half a percent and they can lend money out to you at a uh one and a half percent they're still making one percent yeah that's still good yeah. yeah um of course that's not really the case i mean it, everybody's still <laughs> charging what like three and a half four percent on major loans Something probably like that, yeah. um but that's way less than it should be oh yeah um well i mean like in the 80s well it was like really high particularly in the 80s from what i mm -hmm. understand like and the, just before that too uh during um carter's the carter years uh, interest yeah. rates like really ballooned too yeah um so they were paying i think like roughly um, 15 to 20 percent yeah uh, on a lot of things yeah that's what was my understanding of like the mid 80s and whatnot was that like yeah they were super like i mean some that seems super high to me i mean that seems of course because we've lived, grown up through well this. i was gonna say yeah mm -hmm. we've lived through the age of basically free money like right um and so uh as i was looking at these rates and i i can't remember the numbers exactly but uh, both the CDs and the money markets were less than 1%. Wow. Um, and I, I think the CD, if you had a minimum investment of a, a certain amount, um, it paid like almost half a percent maybe. <laughs> um, and the, or no, so that, that was the money market. And then the, the CD, I think it was like maybe close to 1% if wow. you had that minimum amount for a long enough term because it, you had to yeah. keep it there for a Enough a long time, too. time yeah, yeah, to get it's like those twelve rates. months or fourteen months or something like that. Yeah, um, and of course, the longer you leave it in there, the higher the rate is. Yeah, um, but I was I was looking at that and I was thinking, well, that there's no sense in even. I mean, there is a sense in doing that. Like, if I make a half a percent a year, um, <laughs> and I'm losing two percent a year, well, then I'm really only losing a one and a half percent instead <laughs> of losing the full some 2%. of your loss. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, my money's worth ninety eight fifty at the end of the year instead of ninety eight hundred. That's still something, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, but the the side effect of that, and this is one of those things that like there's those concerns about the various retirement programs and and so forth, is that what you've what you've created through the system of, of enforced low interest rates um, for such a long period of time is that the only place that people can put their money where they could stand to make any kind of, of return on it is the stock market. Yeah, the stock market, like lottery or casino, whatever yeah. you want to call it. Yeah. Like it's You're playing the game of chance out there. Mm -hmm. So that's the only thing you can do is, if you don't want to lose it to inflation, is to try to find something stable that's not going to lose that's going to hopefully gain at a nice rate yeah and so that's if you want to invest yeah and so here's the alternative if you want to invest and you don't want to lose your money yeah you buy stuff yeah right like spend it while it's still worth 100 percent of what it was today hey i'm a big advocate of buying guns Guns just don't <laughs> tend to lose their value. They tend to maintain or increase in their value. I, I advocate it, I, buying gold. <laughs> but uh, I, I think they keep up with inflation, I'm just saying. like, mm. <laughs> And if you need them, you have them. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> nice to have something that's that's useful. Yeah, exactly. It's mm. useful. You don't know. go buy a car. Yeah. Oh, no, no. You don't want to do that. Yeah. That's <laughs> buy property. <laughs> buy, buy something that there's a limited amount of um, that uh, that people may want from you in the future. Exactly. They ain't making any more dirt. Nope. <laughs> yeah, we're making dirt all the time, but <laughs> points made. You get, you get what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, this is, again, you know, one of those side effects. People complain all the time. Well, like, oh, you know, people are just like normal people are going out there and losing their shirts in the stock market. And while um, these fat cats are getting wealthy that know how to manipulate it. Well, yeah, 
you're yeah. right about that. Um, but the reason that they're but people are going out there that, yeah. losing their shirts in the stock market is because there's nowhere else to put their money where they could stand to make a return. Yeah. What else are they going to do with it? You know. Yeah. Um, they either they either Which, lose it one way or they they lose it slowly or they lose it quickly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and the whole time you're propping up, I mean, basically all of that bad investment is just mm -hmm. propping up the stock market, which is the reason that the stock market just goes up and up and up and up. I mean, where else are they going to yeah, put their money? Until it goes down. Yeah, well, yeah, and then you're... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's when, yeah, that's when things when get When the bubble pops. Bad. Yeah. And the bubble always pops. Yeah, and get there eventually. There, there's not unlimited money, just despite what the modern monetary theory people will tell you. Yeah, uh, debts actually do matter. Yeah. Um, and and we'll find out soon enough, I think. Man, I hope not. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I agree. I, I actually, while I disagree with the modern monetary, like I hope they're right. Like, I, yeah. I mean, I, like I, I don't want to see all of this come crashing down. Yeah. Like, well, I wish I could create my own money. Well, me too. But, <laughs> you know. yeah. I wish it worked for me as well as it does for a government. I mean, you can create all of it you want. You got to convince somebody to take it. One of my favorite um, stickers at uh, LibertyStickers.com. Yeah. Uh, which is actually it was uh, Scott Horton's old company, yeah. um, but they they sell you know libertarian type like a lot of anti war and so forth bumper stickers. Yeah. And uh, one of my favorites is uh, actually it probably is my favorite, um, at least that I've seen. They've got hundreds of them. There's oh, no yeah. way I've read through them all. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it says uh, um, things don't cost more. Your money's just worth less because the government keeps counterfeiting. Yeah. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. And, and it goes back to, you know, that's why I, I say buy gold. Uh, we had that discussion about, you know, why gold increases in value. It's not actually yeah. that it increases in value. I mean, there are variations in the value of gold, yeah. um, you know, based on supply and demand like every, any other commodity. Yeah. But um, the, the big movement in the price of gold is more about how much your dollar is worth yeah. than how much the gold is worth. I saw, and I only read the, the headline, so I mean, it's take it for what it's worth, but I saw this headline the other day, and it read, um, why is gold soaring right now? Like, that was just the headline, like, the question, why is gold soaring right now? And, and why like, is the U.S. dollar index going down? <laughs> and, and I could think, you really have to ask that question? Like, I didn't yeah. read the article, so maybe they figured it out in the article, but I was <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Like, there's a million reasons why. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean... Yeah. Yeah, it's just crazy. So buy gold. We actually have an affiliate thing with uh, gold money. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh, Liberty Mike. Or the, no, I'm sorry. The Liberty Mike is our yeah. uh, promo affiliate. code. So if you go and set up an account by any chance at goldmoney.com, um, then use the Liberty Mike as a promo code. Yeah. And they like that. <laughs> don't really know what we get out of it. Yeah, that, I, but. <laughs> I don't know what you get out of it either. <laughs> I think it helps us in some way, but I, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I mean, the affiliate link has to, you know, or the affiliate code has to do something, right? Yeah, I'm sure it does. Thank. Um, now, I pulled all my, I, I sold all my gold that I had through goldmoney.com because they changed their uh, pricing structure for storage. Yeah. And I couldn't afford it. Yeah. Um, with the amount that I held there. But anyway, uh, you can still buy physical gold there too, though. And yeah. I, we might, you know, benefit from that if you use the affiliate code. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, buy gold wherever you want. But um, but we do have a, a, a small relationship with gold money. Yeah. And buying gold is good, like I say. You really can't go wrong. Yeah. Yeah, it... Over time, it will go up. When your dollar is worth a lot, your gold won't be. But when your dollar is not worth anything, your gold will be. I'm just saying the same is true with guns. So <laughs> take that for what it's worth, too. Hey, and Trump may be fixing to give everybody a bunch of money. So it may be gun time again. Yeah. So that we can give it back to them at the end of the year. Yeah. Probably. Um, <laughs> okay. Just one little thing before we go. All right. Uh, because this is something that has always bothered me. Why do I have to keep the record of my state tax return for my federal income tax. <laughs> I have no clue. Does does my state tax return qualify as an income? <laughs> because that doesn't make any sense. That's yeah. just the state giving me the money that they took from me back. 
<laughs> Maybe it How can does. that apply to my income for the following year? It might. <laughs> I just don't, don't see any other reason for them to need that record. Yeah, I, I guarantee you that's what it is. You're probably that, count, that counts as income. <laughs> I, had to, I had to ask somebody about that. Yeah. Um, okay, well, uh, that'll be it for us. Um, like coming in right at an hour, uh, and it's hot. It is hot. I'm sweating. Yep. So that means it's time to go. <laughs> and um, so we plan to be back here in a, in a week unless we decide to skip and go to, straight to the one where it might be cool in here. Um, uh, although I don't think it will be because they're doing the work that day. So Oh, it's going to take some time. Yep. Yeah. It may be worse than I mean, there. it's it's blown in insulation. How long can it possibly take, right? I yeah. think I'm first thing in the morning. Whatever. Yeah. Um, no, we'll do a podcast next week. No, I, I fully intend to do a podcast next week. Yeah. All right. We plan to do a podcast next week. Um, so, uh, you know, um, follow us on Facebook, subscribe on iTunes or Podbean, um, like, share, comment, etc. cetera. Yeah. Is there other stuff? I, I Am I you, missing? I think you covered it. <laughs> okay. Um, and we'll be back uh, at the end of next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try and stay free. Life's short, live free. Ciao. Later.